The Olympic Summer Games in Beijing in 2008 was a milestone in the history of both China and the Olympic movement. Nearly 14 years later, China will be hosting the Olympic Winter Games. What can China offer this time that it wasn't able to back then? What legacy can the world expect when the Games opens on February the 4th next year? And amid some noises calling for disruption of the Games, how can sportsmanship prevail? To discuss this, we have Professor Jia Wenshan from the School of Communication at uh, Chapman University and uh, an adjunct professor at Shandong University in China, joining us from Los Angeles and from Vancouver, Canada, Sarah Jensen, an active commentator and blogger on China-related topics. Gentlemen, welcome to The Point. So, Professor Jia, let me go to you. Each Olympic Games has its own X factor, let's say. The Beijing 20, 2008 Summer Games marked China's emergence as an, economic, as an emerging economic power and a global entertainer. What do you think the X factor will be for the Beijing 2022? Well, I think uh, Beijing um, Olympic Winter Games 2022 would be highlighted by several dimensions of it. Uh, number one, I think it's um, certainly uh, high-tech, especially reflecting the implementation of uh, technologies of industry 4.0, like uh, 5G and AR and cloud computing, etc., mm -hmm. to make uh, this winter games more entertaining, more uh, accessible and uh, healthy and safe. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, it also will be green it will be sustainable, and of course, of course, it also integrates uh, Chinese culture with modernity in many ways, like the, you know, the um, the, the mascot and, um, and and things like right. that. We'll talk so. about that in just a moment. Let me go to Jensen, Mr. Jensen. Why do you think the Chinese government and Chinese people takes take the games so seriously when actually in some other countries they're having debates? Right? Is it worth it to have the Olympic Games? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think the Olympics is, is truly the biggest sporting event in the world. And this is just, it was such an honor. I was in Beijing for 2008 when, when China had hosted their first Olympics. And I was living in Shanghai. And, and wherever you were going in China, um, you know, it was very common to see, you know, many amounts of people going on the streets, you know, chanting for China. There was just a great excitement. And, and it's really an honor. And I think that China has really embraced that. The government, the people realize that this is a chance to really show showcase their country and, you know, showcase China to the world. And so I think that that's main, the main principle, though, is honor. They really realize what a great privilege it is to host the Olympics, and they want to make sure that they always host the best Olympics they can. And you think that the Winter Olympics is also a, a similar opportunity or one step further, Chris? I oh, do, sorry, I, um, I, I, Cyrus. I do think the Winter Olympics are... Yes. Oh, sorry. Me? Yeah, go ahead, please, Cyrus. Yes, sorry. Um, yes, I, I do think it is because, like we mentioned earlier, 2008 Olympics, this was China's really coming out party. You know, that China was, was really becoming an emerging country. Now in 2022, China is a major power in the world and it has producing some amazing technology and it is a very, very large partner for the global economy. So not, it's not China's coming out party. China's now arrived and China is here. And this is, again, going to be a great opportunity to showcase that. Professor Jia, your take on the same question? Well, I think uh, China, uh, Chinese government and the people has taken Olympic Games as a public ritual on the global arena to uh, have deeper understandings and uh, deeper uh, integration into Chinese culture. So I, I'm reminded of one slogan on the hills of um, Li Mountains in, in Xi'an when I arrived uh, back home uh, 14 years ago, right before uh, Olympic Games. Mm -hmm. It says something like, let the world, let China communicate with the world, world. let the world communicate with China. Right. I think that's the steel, the goal. 14 years later mm. in Winter Olympic Games, yeah. Speaking where of the, China yeah. will display its culture. Uh, China also that, displays how... 
Yeah, speaking of that, we just unveiled the medals for the Olympic and Paralympic Games Beijing 2022, and uh, they display some traditional Chinese elements, such as Chinese jade wear, and of course the Olympic emblems. Professor Jia, what's the story about these medals along the same line? Well, these medals are uh, of three kinds, gold, uh, silver, and copper. Uh, they take the shape of the Chinese uh, symbol of Tongxinyuan, which means uh, together as one. That is a symbol of unity. And uh, obviously, it is a call for unity. It's a party for unity of athletes from all cultures and all countries. It is also an invitation for people, for humanity of of, of you know just identifying them as one race that mm. is human race and let's just forget about all those artificial divisions and uh, pick bickering and all that yeah it's it's indeed uh, it could be a great opportunity but uh, for some people may, maybe not so much but still uh, Cyrus I know people are trying including you you're going to do a live streaming on in Vancouver from Vancouver on December the 15th to mark the 50-day countdown to the games um, why do you want to do that? What's the message? Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm really excited for this event because it's, I think it'll be really the first of its kind on YouTube. We're going to be bringing in athletes from Team Canada, athletes from Team China, and I, I really want to promote you know, the, the, what is truly the Olympic spirit. You know, we have these two powerhouse countries uh, coming together, you know, we have, along with every other country in the world, sending their best athletes there. And we really need to take the Olympics as an opportunity to focus on nations coming together, encouraging more dialogue, encouraging um, you know, uh, what the Olympic spirit is. And that is really building a better world through peace and understanding. And again, dialogue is so important right now. Mm -hmm. So I'm very excited for this live stream. It's going to be quite amazing. And I think there's a lot of excitement in Canada. Obviously, Canada is a very strong uh, country you know, for the Winter Olympics. So a lot of excitement coming into this yeah. and, and will be in the future weeks. Of course, if you scout the international headlines, sometimes you are discouraged or frustrated to see some, you know, sensational headlines or, as Professor Jia mentioned just now, about uh, dividing people, about political messages. And, and yet, uh, Cyrus, when you are preparing for this countdown, what has been the kind of reaction? Has there been much support for the noises distracting away from what sports should really stand for? You know, from what I've experienced here in Vancouver, um, even with the work that I do on, on my YouTube channel and, and really trying to advocate more understanding about China, uh, many people are, are very optimistic. Uh, from what I've found, many people are, are, are very curious to learn more. And I think that, you know, again, when it comes down, Canadians love their sports. So when it comes down to the Olympics, um, I mean, Canadians, we're going to be cheering for Team Canada. I mean, that's the bottom line. You know, we're going to be cheering for them and obviously cheering for China to host a good games. Again, it's a great opportunity for the world to come together. And that's why all of us, why everybody watches the Olympics. It is such a special time. Mm. So, you know, the sentiment for what I've experienced has been very good here, very positive on the ground. Good to hear that. Professor Jia, how not to be distracted by these noises? You are based in the United States. Days. You must hear about these uh, a lot, I suppose. Yes, I'm aware that, uh, of course, there are some human rights groups and uh, politicians, and um, they lobby for Congress to make statements, to mm -hmm. put public pressure to the uh, International Olympic Games uh, Committee and the Chinese government to but this is exactly the kind of thing which is trying to do, which is trying to, do, to advance human rights. That is, uh, people to have better understandings so that they wouldn't be damaged uh, through unnecessary uh, strife. And just think about all the conflicts which occurred in the past, uh, primarily because of people's strong positions against something which is not actually true. Uh, China has really taken human rights seriously over the past 40 years, especially in terms of economic development, uh, poverty reduction, and things like that. So China has taken a material, I would say materialist type of human rights and the group rights, uh, unlike some rights groups in the West which argues very, for very abstract, religiously based rights, individually based rights. 
which still end up seeing you know lots of people who are still homeless because though that rice discourse doesn't take care of of the people who are homeless a uh, former American athlete and current member of the IOC, the International Olympic Committee, Anita de Frens, recently wrote in the Financial Times that a boycott affects the athletes far more than anything else. Professor Shah, uh, why is it important for sp sports to be left alone as sports? And uh, is it wise to really try the futile practice of boycott because it has been tried in the past and nothing really changed? That's true because there was a classic example of uh, United States boycotting the Moscow Olympic Games and uh, a generation of American athletes, uh, their dreams, their professions have been destroyed and they're still very resentful of that decision. As a matter of fact, uh, President Jimmy Carter uh, had a public apology and a regret, expressed regrets over that kind of decision. It was rash, it was uh, you know, if we were to make a decision again, he would not have made that kind of decision. And so, yes, separate sports from politics, especially if there is geopolitics, geopolitical tensions, uh, sports are rare platforms for people to come together and uh, to uh, have better understandings, just like, you know, ping pong mm. diplomacy. You know? Yes. Finally, uh, let me go to Cyrus once again. Now, um, because only spectators from China, including foreigners residing in Man Ch uh, Chinese mainland, will be permitted to uh, buy tickets to go into the venue. So um, obviously you have a bit more cheers for the Chinese team than the international teams. Um, is there, would that be a concern for foreign competitors or foreign spectators that, you know, it would not be fair for the foreign teams competing against Chinese athletes on their home turf, cheered on by their home supporters? No, I, I think um, many of the Chinese fans are going to be very aware of the situation that um, obviously only people residing in China are going to have the chance to attend the games. Uh, China will certainly have, um, let's say, home field advantage or a lot of support, but I've spent a lot of time in China and I, I know that the Chinese fans will embrace um, excellence. So it doesn't matter if another country, you know, wins the gold medal. Um, you know, we saw that we saw this, and this is what's a beautiful thing about sport is that we, you know, we cheer for each other. We want the best athlete to win, and I think you're going to see many Chinese fans uh, again embracing this Olympic movement, the Olympic spirit. They they're going to know that there is not going to be, uh, you know, fans from overseas coming in, and they're probably going to even cheer, you know, for all of the countries there. So I wouldn't be surprised if you see a lot of Chinese fans um, maybe even wearing, you know, waving some flags from some other countries, you know, and also supporting those, those athletes. I think you're going to see um, a, a very um, supportive crowd no matter what. Absolutely. Hopefully, hopefully. Uh, which sport will we be looking out to, Saris, and then Professor Jia? Uh, what's your question um, again? I'll, I'm going to be looking for the hockey. Okay, uh, hockey, for hockey for Saris oh, oh. and Professor Jia? Uh, what sports I'm yeah. look, I would look for? You would be looking out for the most. <laughs> oh, I think I think uh, ice skating. Ice skating? Why? Uh, ice skating is certainly exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you beautiful. know, Southern California is pretty dry, and uh, yeah. we don't have that much ice around. And I remember, uh, there was a great park here, Irvine. Uh, I think there was a ice ring. At one time, my kids uh, loved to uh, do I ice skating. Okay. I, I myself wanted to do it myself, too. Uh, okay. But like I said, also, I, I like uh, what our uh, Canadian friends said, mm -hmm. that, that the Chinese have become very mature uh, spectators of sports. And many of them, you know, entertain themselves mm -hmm. with watching American sports, even though uh, without any Chinese participant, right. participation, yeah. participation in right. it. We have to leave it and there. They Professor Jia. Share yes. about them. Yeah, we and have so to leave it there. I think uh, it reminds Professor Jia, we have to leave idea. it there. Thank you so much. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of The Point with me, Li Xin. And many thanks to Cyrus Jensen, of course, joining us from Canada. You can join me, you can find me on Facebook and Twitter using the handle Li Xin in Beijing. Thanks for watching. You've got the point.